Hi, I'm Danny Aiello. I live in this town, small town in New Jersey, safe with my family. We choose not to believe unthinkable acts of violence can touch us in our communities. But for many of us who moved away from the big cities like my family and I and settled into suburban towns, we are faced with the reality that violence still exists anywhere, in any town, to anyone. Such was the case in Montvale, New Jersey, a quiet hamlet nestled on the border of New York and New Jersey, known for its apple orchards, local produce stands, and a strong sense of community. Montvale changed rapidly in the 1970s. Montvale was a very simple, easy-going town. It wasn't a town concerned about image. Um, Montvale was, uh, in the early years, a, a frontier, actually, considering people coming from Lower Bergen County, becoming uh, very uh, concentrated with houses, uh, we're moving up to Montvale, and Montvale was growing uh, pretty rapidly. The town was kind of made, split in two. Uh, the west side of town was where the corporations and uh, we had some very upscale homes and, and, and things built on that side of town, whereas the east side of town was more the older part of town, and it, it was still very nice, but it was just a, a different community over there, more uh, neighborhood. Very nice place to live, nice community. It was in this small community on Thanksgiving weekend, 1976, that something horrific happened. Something no one could have ever imagined. Young Harry Delaroche Jr. returned home from the Citadel Military Academy for Thanksgiving break and murdered his entire family in cold blood. His father, Harry Sr., his mother, Mary Jane, and his younger brothers, Ronnie and Eric, all shot dead at point blank range. Harry Jr. claimed he was abused and tortured his entire life, and he just wanted the pain to end. It appeared to be an open and shut case. Harry Jr. was tried and ultimately convicted. But after the arrest, a new account came to light. Harry Jr. said, and still maintains to this day, that his confession was given under duress. He admits to murdering his brother Ronnie in a fit of rage after discovering his brother Ronnie murdered the entire family. Harry Delaroche Jr. resides today in Southwood State Prison in Bridgeton, New Jersey, where he is serving four consecutive life sentences. There. How are you doing, John? Nice seeing you again okay. today. Here, have a seat. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Dad. You're welcome. So why did you shoot Ronnie? Anger. Temporary insanity. I don't know what you want to call it. It was just like snapped. To go in through that chain of events makes me wonder for a pro-social kid um, to what extent he's got a good grasp on what's really going on and in terms of the consequences. K kids in particular operating on that, that rush are acting or reacting at this point violently from one person to another and there's not very much if at all conscious deliberation. Close to the center of town, Harry Delaroche Sr., his wife Mary Jane, and their three young sons, Harry Jr., Ronald, and Eric, lived in a modest red clapboard house. Harry Sr. was some kind of an executive with Ford Motor Company at that time. And Mary Jane was just very active, you know, in the community and so on. They, they were active in the church, too. I think by this time, Harry Sr. was a member of the church council. Both uh, Mr. Delaroche and uh, Mary Jane, his wife, were active in many, many uh, things, Little League, um, Cub Scouts, and things for their children. I think the Delaroche family was still hanging on to the idolistic 50s, and you know that this was the way to live. 
His father had an attitude, his father grew up in West New York in that area, that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Unfortunately, Harry was not the tough type. Coming from a broken home, Harry Sr. modeled himself to be the perfect father and have the perfect family. I respected Harry's father and his mother, sweet, sweet people, just almost an ideal Montville couple. Ronald, or Ronnie, was the middle child. He was very active in sports and school. He made friends quickly and was very outgoing. Eric was the youngest. He was a happy-go-lucky kid who was known for getting into mischief. He always looked up to his big brother, Harry. A guy who was Ronnie's age and a little bully, uh, next block up, uh, I came home one day and I saw him beating up on Eric on the front lawn. So I yanked the kid up and I smacked him around. And I normally didn't do that kind of thing, but I mean, that, that sort of sticks up, or I would stick up for Eric. Harry Sr. encouraged all of his sons to share in his love of firearms and became gun enthusiasts at an early age. Following his father's encouragement, Harry Jr. spent hours at the Park Ridge pistol and rifle range. Harry, approximately how many guns and what type of guns were uh, in your home? There were four. There was the rifle, the target rifle. There was a 22 target pistol, a 38, and a 9 millimeter. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't everybody. Different people had them. Not everybody advertised it. Harry Jr. found it difficult to fit in. He was mocked verbally, abused physically, well into his teenage years at Pascac Hills High School. A lot of the way he looked with the horn rim glasses, he did the geek type look, uh, had a personification of weird. But he was really down inside a good guy, just that some of the kids couldn't realize this. I think he stood out in one way because he could be very arrogant. You know, I don't care what they say about me or I'll, I'll show them. There was that side of him. And there was the other inside of him that was very, very shy. I think he probably didn't know who he was. Nothing in the quiet town hinted to the horrors that stirred beneath the surface. In reality, Harry Sr. was a taskmaster and a strict disciplinarian. My friend Mark Jurisic had voted Harry most likely to commit a psychotic killing. This was before this happened. I think he loved his father. I think he feared his father, um, you know, the punishments that, that he would get if he did something wrong. I think he respected his father, and above all, I don't think he wanted to disappoint his father. Pick you up by the hair, pick you up by the neck, uh, the web belts with the metal buckles, wrap around his hand, hit you with the buckle part. Harry Jr., the eldest, affectionately known as Hatchy, was born premature. But young, frail Harry Jr. carried all of his father's hopes and dreams. But like a lot of other parents in the community, uh, we have high hopes for our children. And sometimes we want them to be things that they, they can't be. With Harry, his father put a lot of pressure on him to attend a school that his father wanted him to go to. Did you want to go to the Citadel? Yes and no. With the Boy Scouting and the Civil Air Patrol background, it seemed like interesting. Harry Sr.'s proudest moment came when Harry Jr. was accepted into the Citadel, a prestigious military academy. After graduation, Harry Jr. was assured a military assignment, thus making Harry Sr.'s discipline well worth it. I remember one of the neighbors saying when the, the family got in the car to go to go to the Citadel to take him down that everybody seemed happy and excited except Harry. Going to Citadel, my first reaction was he's going to get eaten alive. You just can't take a kid that has problems and put him in a place like that. Harry Jr. heard horrible stories about how harshly the freshmen were treated. Harry's lone tendencies made him a target. He was forced to experience abuse in another environment. We're talking about kids. I mean, they might have been 19, 20, 21, whatever, from sophomore to senior, with uh, too much power and anger and whatnot. 
and not enough sense and supervision. Harry Jr. received letters from his parents and younger brother Ronnie. They spoke so proudly that he was a Citadel man. In letters, Harry Sr. mentioned Ronnie was out of control. Ronnie had mentioned he was experimenting with marijuana, partying with his friends, and getting stoned. As the Thanksgiving Day holiday neared, Harry prepared to return home. He decided in his mind he would not be returning to the Citadel. But how could he shatter his father's dreams? So a few days before the Citadel recessed for Thanksgiving break, Harry Delaroche Jr. headed back to Montvale, New Jersey. He would never return to the Citadel. November 28, 1976 was unusually warm. It was like an Indian summer, and it became very foggy, almost like an Alfred Hitchcock type movie. Harry Jr. felt a tremendous pressure to return when break was over. This started an internal time bomb. That night, Harry Jr.'s life would soon take a drastic turn. Shortly thereafter, it was like, like a moment of clarity, like, what have I done? And then, what are people going to think? You know, and that's when I realized, like, this doesn't look good. Patrolman Carl Olson was the first to encounter Harry Jr. that night. I was checking a the gas station at the corner of Park Avenue and Grand Avenue. When I heard a car just winding up coming down Grand Avenue, east on Grand Avenue towards the center of town, towards me. And just from the sound of it, I knew that the car was not gonna stop for the stop street. So I just flipped on my overhead lights at that time. And I stepped to the street with my flashlight to stop him. And at that time, the car stopped. And Harry jumped out of the car and screamed that they're dead, they're all dead. And he jumped back in the car and took off. So, you know, I just jumped in the car because I really didn't uh, know exactly what he was saying. I knew something was wrong. So at that time, I called for Officer Perotti to meet me at the Delaroche house. We both uh, got out of the car. And at that time, he told me that the, the, there was a problem in the house and that he found his parents and his brother dead. We entered the house. It was dark. Harry started up to the first landing and just pointed up, and he said he didn't want to go up. So then I proceeded up the stairs. And not knowing what was going on, I took my gun. Because I, I had no idea what we were going into. As I reached the top landing, there was a bedroom on my left-hand side. I looked in the door, and I saw, uh, with my flashlight on, shine my light in, and Mrs. Delaroche was laying on the bed. There was quite a bit of blood on the pillow and on the bed itself, both sides of the bed. I went in, and she was obviously dead. At the far end of the hall, maybe Oh, 25 feet, I guess. I could see a pair of legs sticking out. So I went down there, and Mr. Delaroche was lying face down, and he was also passed away. And Eric was lying on the floor on the other side of the room, also dead. Eric moved and groaned, and I thought he was still alive. So I went over to him. And I picked him up and couldn't get a response to him. I go, Eric, it's just a dream. And right at that point, he slumped down. And the reality is he, he might have been dead at that point in time. It was just probably his muscles relaxing and air escaping his lungs. But to me, I thought he died in my arms right then and there. And while talking to Ronnie, I had noticed okay, Ronnie's bed was like this. There was a window here. There was a, Eric's desk here and Eric's bed here. And I noticed on the windowsill, 
right next to Ronnie's bed was the pistol. So at that point, I put out a all points bulletin uh, over the radio to, uh, to look for him and that he may be armed and dangerous. 12 hours later, the police found Ronnie shot to death in an attic stuffed in a trunk. Harry Jr. was arrested and charged with four counts of murder in the first degree. My association with Harry Delarosa was that I was retained as attorney for him in the incident involving his family in Montvale. I recall on that particular weekend coming home and there was a phone call to me that uh, there had been a, an incident that happened up in Montvale and that this young man, Harry Delarosa, had been uh, charged over these was being held in the Bergen County Jail. I went down and met him down there. At that particular time, he was being held alone on what we would consider a type of suicide watch. After hours of questioning Harry Jr., he confessed to the murders of his father, mother, and two brothers. Detective Delapri from the prosecutor's office and our Michael O'Donovan, our detective, were interviewing him, and I believe uh, Lieutenant Scarangella got the information that the, the brother was found in the attic, and he knocked on the door to tell him that when they confronted Harry, and at that time, it's my understanding that's when the confession took place. When I got the confession, and I read it carefully a, a bunch of times, it was extremely detailed. And it followed the uh, movement of the bodies, uh, the father and mother still being in the bed, uh, the one brother, uh, was not only shot, but he had been pounded in the face with some type of weapon, and the other brother was just shot. And, uh, but there had been no fingerprints on the gun. Uh, there were no other things. Apparently, the confession was so strong that the police officers felt that they didn't have to. Pastor Roy Nilsson was a staple at the jail. Harry made no admissions. Uh, other than, Pastor, I've just flipped. And I guess at that moment, I thought of him, frankly, more as a son of mine than any other relationship. When I was going over the confession with him, at, at a while he said, well, Ronnie did it. And I said, well, you know, we're going to have to prove that. And uh, I said, you know, you've confessed to these things already. I said, but I don't think you're going to convince anybody that Ronnie did this. There's no way. If you read the the, uh, the transcript of his confession, I mean, he goes into such details with uh, what happened to Eric. You know, how, how could he even know that if he wasn't the one that was there? At the courthouse, he was introduced to Lieutenant Bert Ulm as one of the polygraph and lie detect experts. After Harry took the polygraph test, he asked, how did I do? Almas proceeded to tell him. He thought he was lying. I think you killed your family. Harry asked, how much time do you think I will do? It was then that Harry proceeded to give Almas a complete oral confession. Again, they advised Harry of his rights to remain silent. The court reporter arrived and Harry confessed to the murders in incredible detail. Harry's confession was 21 type pages. He tells stories of being hazed at the Citadel. He admits he lied about his mother's health to get out of school early. He admits he was unable to talk to his father about not returning to the Citadel. As he put it, you can't talk to him. Then came the details. I was just trying to think of some way to get out of going to the Citadel. And I came in, three o'clock, and it was seven hours before I had to leave for the plane. And there was nothing I could do to stop it. I had the pistol on the bed. I was sitting in my room for a while, thinking of what I was going to do, thinking I can't go back. And I really couldn't tell my parents because they wouldn't listen. So I seen my father. So I kept walking back and forth from the entrance to my room to the entrance of my parents' room. 
walked in there, said, no, I can't. Walked back to my room, sat down for a little while, kept on doing it. Finally, I walked into my parents' room, got real close to my father. Must have stood in his room about a half hour, just holding the pistol up. And then finally I said, I can't go back to the Citadel. Close my eyes and pulled the trigger. And that set it off. Shot my mother right then. And then I, I went into my brother's room, Ronnie. When I turned on the light, Ronnie was laying on the side of his bed. His eyes were open like he was in shock, like he, he didn't know what was happening. I guess he didn't. I shot him. And I went over to Eric. Eric started to get up, shot him twice. He was still getting up. Then he started to go back down on his bed. Then I went back to my room and just sat there for a few minutes. Then I heard some really heavy breathing and I thought, oh my God. I went back into my brother's room and there was Eric. He was trying to get up and trying to get out. He was saying, he was saying something. I couldn't hear him. I, I put my hand over his eyes and put my hands over his eyes. I said, Eric, go to sleep. Go to sleep. It's just a dream. I'm trying to calm him down. And he got up and started screaming. And I hit him with the pistol butt in the head. Then he went down to the ground. I hit him again. He was still breathing. And the second time I hit him, he wasn't breathing anymore. When he had made the first confession, he was just so tired. Uh, tired exhausted and he said the the whole idea was beginning to hit me and he said frankly pastor i would have said anything and that confession had been given after i'd been awake for 36 hours hadn't eaten anything for 24 and had been with the police for 12 hours as they say interviewing me you know they wouldn't admit to interrogation they kept everybody away from me my aunt and uncle came uh pastor nielsen came various people came they wouldn't let me speak to anybody the statement was a combination of what ronnie had done what I had done, what I thought, and things I overheard. In fact, there's things on there like, I heard you found uh, skin and hair under somebody's nails. I mean, there's no ways for me to know that, but I mean, I'd heard these police talking with each other and then asking me about different things. All that got incorporated into a statement. I felt guilty about shooting Ronnie, you know. I believed, because I didn't stand up to my father about this thing with Ronnie, the drug thing, I felt guilty in the fact that Ronnie had done this. So it was actually, I felt guilty for my family dying. The confession that Harry Delaroche gave the police uh, after he failed the polygraph uh, was, could only come from the lips of the murderer. Sulkin, a handsome and adept attorney, offered a plea deal that would have Harry Jr. out in 10 years. We had an offer at the time of trial from the prosecutor for a plea bargain and I spoke with Harry and his aunt and uncle and explained to them the ramifications of it and Harry said no. I said Harry they're offering you this you'll be subject to in 10 years now you're 18 19 before you're 30 you have a good chance of being getting your life back together and uh, he said no. What he really said well if I take a plea bargain and go to jail I'm gonna get killed. I won't last in jail. If you were to do it over again? I would ask them if they would accept what's called an Alfred plea, which it's uh, essentially, I'm maintaining my innocence, but I'm taking the plea. What about talking to a psychiatrist or a doctor here in the institution 
working towards some type of a confession. Why, why would I confess to something I didn't do? There's that. I mean, but you're, you're not. Well, when you do that, you're not. You're not helping yourself, and you're not helping them. You know. I mean, if I would say if I would say something just to get out, would you really want me out? On January 5th, 1978, Judge James F. Madden presided over the most horrendous case Montvale, New Jersey, had ever endured. The case had two ways to attack it. If you kept the confession out, there was an excellent chance that Judge Madden would have difficulty letting the case go forward because they had no other proofs. There was nothing in there that said that Harry Delaroche was the man who pulled the trigger. The other aspect was if you couldn't get that, then you had to argue that he was temporarily insane. Judge Madden admitted the confession as valid, a major victory for the prosecution, and another setback for the defense. I had no idea there was a confession coming, and it certainly had a big impact on all of us. Uh, everybody in the courtroom's faces still, and shocked. I myself was shocked. Witnesses testified about Harry's high school abuse, continuing at South Carolina's famed military school, the Citadel. Early on in the training process, he began to stand out. He was definitely someone who didn't adjust, who wanted to, perhaps wanted to be noticed, and we began to take notice of him. Harry was one of maybe four or five cadets that always seemed to get the worst of it. And when he was here, he really didn't fit in with the other 40 freshmen in November Company. I thought he was one of the worst cadets in his class. Harry Jr. was a northerner in a tough southern school. It appeared that Harry was incapable of conforming to the rigid rules and honor codes enforced at the Citadel. Harry was basically a square peg in a round hole. Harry had a tremendous fear of going back to the Citadel. I have a letter or I had a letter which I turned into uh, Mr. Taylor uh, before Thanksgiving, which was written to me, saying that I have to come home and talk with you about some things, but first I have to talk with my parents. He had told his family he didn't want to talk about the, um, the Citadel until the Saturday before he went back. Uh, to school and he, he didn't want them to ask a lot of questions and I think maybe at that Thanksgiving table he was also anxious to get away before there were too many questions. They talked about how proud they were of him and you know it's so wonderful to have a son at the Citadel and everybody asks us about you and, and we're so lucky. So he's living with all of this while he knows in his heart that somehow He's not going back. When it became apparent to him that he could no longer um, withstand this military school and wanted to leave, the record suggests that the parents were not supportive of that decision. He says repeatedly he didn't talk about his problems. He tried to keep sort of a, an image that he could handle everything. He intensely disliked it. And he had made a decision to leave, set things in motion so that he could leave. Then he comes home over the holidays, and it becomes increasingly apparent that he can't leave, um, at least with his parents' blessing. Harry Jr. testified to a packed courtroom. Harry Jr. insisted he take the stand in court. His lawyer, John Taylor, believed Harry thought of this as his day of glory. Mr. Delroach's testimony uh, was basically uh, an attempt to repudiate his confession. The story now was no, no, I didn't, I didn't kill my family. Here's what happened. I look in the door, and there's, I know, first thing I notice is Ronnie. And he's sitting up on the middle of the bed, and he's got like a dazed look, and I'm wondering like, what's going on? And I happen to look over to Eric's bed, because Eric, Ronnie and Eric were in the same room, and I noticed Eric on the floor, and I could see there's blood around him. So I went back down the hallway in my parents' room. I see there's darkness around their pillow, especially my father's pillow. So I look closer and I think it's blood. So I go back into my brother's room and ask Ronnie what happened. You know, he explained what had happened, that he had shot my parents and he had shot Eric. Salkin tore into the image of the tortured youth. Salkin forced Harry Jr. to admit he lied under oath. The fact that you're telling 
the police, you don't know where your brother is, when you're the one who put your brother in the box in the attic, that's a lie. So uh, the transcript of the trial at that point would reflect, well, he's trying to not have to say in front of the jury, yeah, I lied under oath. And he's, well, it wasn't exactly true. You lied under oath. Well, I, I left something out. You lied under oath. Yes, I lied under oath. His lawyers let him take the stand with the hope that the jury would show Harry Jr. some leniency and rule temporary insanity. Into the trial, we brought in a psychiatrist who testified on our behalf of temporary insanity. Dr. David Galena, the defense's psychiatric expert, spoke about Harry Jr.'s intellect and role in the Della Roach home. Throughout the entire evaluation, uh, essentially uh, gave back to me both versions of what happened that evening. At times, he admitted the entire uh, episode. It was my feeling, however, that when one considered his mental status and his activity, within the context of what was happening within his family, that he was operating in a psychotic state at that moment. The term insanity is not recognized medically, but the closest thing uh, to it, uh, the synonym perhaps, a good choice of words, would be psychosis. And, and that word was never used in terms of Harry Delaroche. John Taylor, in the middle of the trial, without asking me, he, he said, well, hypothetically, can I bring this up? And I'm like, I really don't want you to, like, like temporary insanity. I said, I don't really like that idea. In the middle of the trial, he changed the plea from three counts not guilty, one count not guilty due to temporary insanity, to four counts temporary insanity. So essentially, he wasn't asking the jury whether I was guilty or innocent. He was asking the jury whether I was temporarily insane or guilty, and therefore no choice at all to the jury. You know, he bad, Taylor basically screwed me. The last uh, statement I made to the jury is one I had actually thought of about six months before the trial because I knew this was going to be my last uh, statement. And I said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, I have one more thing to say to you today before you begin your deliberations. Don't let the truth become Harry Delaroche's fifth victim. Harry Jr. returned to his cell under suicide watch while he awaited the jury's deliberations. The trial lasted three weeks. And after six and a half hours of tense deliberation, the jury returned its verdict. Harry William Frederick Delaroche Jr. waited to hear his fate. Guilty on all four counts of first degree murder. Judge Madden ordered that sentences be served concurrently. Harry Jr. showed no emotion as he did throughout the trial. But he said, at least I don't have to go back. I see you're going to prison. Meant nothing. Harry had expressed a wish to um, go to the cemetery on, on the way to prison. And the aunt went with him and uh, the sheriff. And the aunt said that, that she saw Harry closer to tears then, um, than at any time. Usually in a funeral home, you gather the family together uh, beforehand for a private viewing. I went in and saw that and uh, Eric uh, had no face left. But there was one relative, uh, the guy they called Tough John. There were a couple of Johns, but he was Tough John. No, no, I want to see him. I said, John, I, I, I can assure you they're there, there. You know, Mr. Spearing is there. They're, but I don't know if you want to see this. I want to see him. So he saw them all, and then when he got to Eric, he just melted. I was determined to pray for Harry, and out loud and publicly as well. And uh, I could care less what anybody thought of it. I mean, nobody tells me who and what I pray for. Nobody. Mental health professionals and the legal system proposed their answers but in the end, Monvale had to cope with the gruesome reality that anyone's son is capable of committing this horrendous act. When we say the word parricide, it, it technically means the killing of a close relative. However, in this country, in the last 25 years, it's become increasingly associated with the killing of a parent, a mother matricide, a father, father patricide. If we look at 
who's doing the uh, killing of parents. Surprisingly uh, to many people, the majority of parents are killed by adult children, that is children who are over 18 years of age, 18 or over. And so usually these are kids who have been abused in a number of ways. And if there's abuse, there is almost always, if not always, neglect in that no one is protecting these kids. So if you have, for example, as in the typical case, one abusive parent, then the other parent, if that parent is not protecting that child and shielding that child from the abuse, is really neglecting that child. Um, in cases like that where there is abuse and there is family discord, one of the things I always say to parents is if there are guns in the home, those guns should be removed because at that point, oftentimes individuals are reacting more out of emotion. And if it ever gets to that point, you, the, the commonality in these cases is that there is typically easily available weapons for the adolescent to choose if he gets to that breaking point. I and mean, if you look at Harry's situation, he had several risk factors. He was born prematurely. Uh, there may have been some time that he was in the hospital. There could be some issues even of bonding that we don't know early on. Then he's picked on in school. Um, again, according to the record, that would certainly have a tremendous effect on self-esteem. And the question would be to what extent did the parents protect him from that? Um, you know, if they did not help him deal with that, um, effectively, then he internalizes that. And the impression that I get from what I have read suggests that Harry's way of dealing with things was sort of to swallow hard and just take it in, um, sort of very high on internal control. And then the same thing in the family situation, the very high expectations, probably from what my reading of the record is, parents that truly loved the, that family and wanted the best for their kids. However, the message that Harry could have gotten clearly is that the love was conditional. You get problems, like a lot of kids I've had problems, I can relate, right. you know. Um, people reach a breaking point. Is there that chance that you just kind of lost yourself and just snapped? And you got all these people insisting I did this. And I said, well, maybe, maybe I did. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe whatever. But then I look at these, look at certain evidential things, and I'm saying, well, if that's true, what they're saying, how could this happen? So. So there is a chance that maybe you just kind of lost no, no, I'm a sense no. of, of reality at the time. No, what I'm saying is that I believe the people who say that I did that are wrong. Do you have nightmares? of what happened that night? No. You know, I, I used to wake up uh, around 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. How right. long did that go on for? A couple years. Do you miss your family? Yes, I do. Do you think about them every day? Yes. And how hard is it for you knowing that uh, you're here and they're somewhere else? You know, I think, I mean, it, you think about the things that could have been, things I should have done. It's just say it. So what really did happen to the De La Roche family? Even now, over 30 years later, there are still so many unanswered questions in this tragic story. When Harry recanted his testimony, why was no further investigation conducted? Why would the prosecutor offer a plea bargain? And why wasn't that plea bargain accepted? Were there any political factors that contributed to the outcome of the case? 
How could something so horrible, so tragic, happen to this seemingly normal family next door? Issues of abuse, violence, and even peer pressure are as relevant today as they were 30 years ago, perhaps even more so. The Delaroche murders represent the collapse of the modern American family. Harry could indeed be anyone's son. <laughs>